forgiveness. We reflect upon your grace and your mercy in our lives, even, even when it's hard to see at times. And as such, we, we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
choir. We really appreciate that. Do let me soar on the wings of your love and let me share it with my five people that I pray for every day. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke 12, 41 through 48. This is not an easy scripture. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of his slaves to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if the slave says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and if he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour that he does not know, and will cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. That slave, who knew what his master wanted, did not prepare himself or do what was wanted, will receive a severe beating. But one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from one whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. So ends the reading of the word. Make this palatable, sir. <laughs> I was going to say, ready to have some fun with this one, huh? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe the kids can help. The kids come on down. Oh. No. <laughs> And the, uh, the concert tonight, or this afternoon is free, so you don't need to be a, a part of the, uh, have a ticket for it. And there's cookies afterwards. <laughs> Go for a cookie. Yeah, maybe, if they're chocolate chip. No. Okay, yeah, okay. So, where have you seen Jesus to this past week? Anybody seen Jesus this week? Yeah, Scott? Did you see Jesus? Where at? In your room? How so? Just did? Okay. You saw Jesus at lunch? Yeah, how so? What was Jesus doing at lunch? Not sure, huh? <laughs> Sisters. Yeah. Yes, Scott. He was taking a nap in your bed. Oh, right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Jesus, right? God said to rest, so right. Jesus was having a Sabbath. All right. Perfect. Well, this week, um, you know, we're talking about all the ways in which we should find Jesus and to be Jesus in the world to someone. And so this week is about how do we use the, the, our gifts for God? And so, come on up here, Joplin. So how is it, what I want to know and why I have, I have the mic here is... For each of you to tell me what you're good at. What are you good at? So, okay, so we're just going to start on this end and then work our way over. So, Jensen? Football. Football, all right. Joplin, what are you good at? Running? Being a church. Being a what? 
Uh, well, I probably can't repeat that on the radio. <laughs> Here's a proud parent moment. Jumping. Jumping. All right. Soccer. 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 Cooking. Cooking. Jump rope. Jump rope. Sleeping. Sleeping. Perfect. You and Jesus taking a nap. All right. Gymnastics. Gymnastics. <laughs> Reading. Reading. Sake. <laughs> Wrestling. Wrestling. All right. All right. So a lot of uh, sports in here. Sounds like right. Wrestling and soccer and football and jumping. Okay. Do you have one, Emily? Say something. Can you say it? Can you say hello? Can you say something? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Say hello. Yeah, it's not really a toy. It's a tool. <laughs> so that everyone can hear you. So how do you use football or uh, soccer or wrestling or jump roping or sleeping or reading for to show your love for Jesus. Sleeping makes you grow. It does make you grow. Yeah, sleeping does that. that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. You can help other people, right? If they if they're they missed a tackle or they missed the ball, right? You don't want to laugh at them and make fun of them, right? Yeah. So you just are, are kind, right? So so what, what we're going to talk about today is how do we show that love for Jesus in what we do and, in, and how we do it. And so you all are really good at a number of things, probably just not one, but we just have time for one today. And for you to be able to use all the things that you're good at and then to use that to help show Jesus' love. All right, so let's pray. Thank you, God, for Jesus and his love and for soccer and wrestling and football and jump roping and reading and cooking and sleeping. Did I miss one? gymnastics yeah and help us to use it to show your love to others amen all right thank you for coming down all right and let uh, let us pray God, may the words that I say and the things we all do make our life song sing and bring a smile to you. Amen. See, Nancy, if I, if I put a little space in there, it takes the, the edge off that scripture. No? <laughs> Well, the parable that, that Nan, or, or the interpretation of the parable that Nancy read um, is really about slaves being attentive to their master. You know, so like for example, if a if the master comes home at 3 a.m., the slave is expected to be ready for the master when he gets there and to attend to whatever needs he may have at 3 a.m. If uh, if the master leaves on on a trip or or just goes away to check on on property uh, far far away, well, the work of the house is supposed to continue as if the master was right there, uh, watching over all of the work. And so Jesus is basically saying that those who who slack off or uh, goof off that would be mine. Uh, become lazy or, or inattentive to their master 
will be severely punished when the master returns. Parables like uh, the one that Jesus shared earlier in chapter 12 fall into the literary category called apocalyptic. And uh, apocalyptic is, uh, means the interpretation or, or the story, the parable in this case, is all about the destructive end of the world or a cata catastrophic uh, event as in uh, what you see there, right? A meteor hitting, hitting the earth. And uh, you know, Hollywood does a great job with these. Or you might remember uh, Armageddon. There was one year when there were two movies about asteroids hitting the earth. And the, the movie uh, 2012 was another one. The Day After Tomorrow was another one. I mean, you know, it makes for great theater. And it also makes for great stories as well. And yet, what Jesus is saying is, pay attention. For when the master, right, when Jesus comes back, why, it's going to be the end. As sometimes you see in, in a, a goofy displays like this, right? Well, most parables, like, like good literature, can have more than one meaning. And, and so, you know, if, if there's a way in which uh, it's not necessarily the, the main meaning, you know, as, as throughout the centuries people have seen it this way, if there's another way to see it, I'm going to go there. You should all know that by now, right? Well, the parable of the slaves has an important here and now meaning that I think is more important for us to hear than the apocalyptic, end of the world meaning. Because if we don't do the here and the now right, what happens at the end of the world may not really matter. So we have to focus on, on the here and the now. Which is why I had Nancy read the explanation of the parable rather than just the parable itself. You can, you can read that for yourselves in Luke 12. You know, in the meaning of the power of this parable for us in the here and now comes begins in, in verse 43 where Jesus says unlike Garfield blessed is the slave whom the, his master will find at work when he arrives and those who the master finds at work will be put in charge of in this case the interpretation is all of his possessions and the explanation point, I think, on what the, the point of this parable is for us in the here and now comes really at verse 47, where he says, The slave who knew what his master wanted, but did not prepare himself or do what was wanted, will receive a severe beating. That's the hard part, isn't it? Yeah, that's the that's called DCF part. But really, I think you know, what he is saying there is is that if if you're a slave and you don't do what your master wants, there are consequences. There's a punishment that is gonna be meted out. Maybe I should have asked the kids about that. <laughs> Who knows what I'd have gotten, huh? <laughs> Well, and the reason why there's a consequence for not doing what has been asked of you by, the, by your master is at the end of this, of this passage, right? That from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. So my summary of this passage is this. Jesus has given us salvation. Hopefully we can all agree on that. Jesus has given us salvation, which is the greatest gift. He's actually freed us from our slavery of sin and death. But he's still the master. No matter however we want to spin it, he's the master. He is our master. 
But as those who have been entrusted with the responsibility of salvation, we have to live out our lives as doing the Lord's work all the time. In part why I, I want the kids to be able to see Jesus in their lives is that he, we don't have to wait for the return. He's here. So if we do what we're supposed to do as a part of our responsibilities as part of the body of Christ, as members in the Lord, it doesn't really matter if he comes back or not or when the end of the world is. If we're doing what's right now, we're good. See, I think it's more important for the here and the now and the versus the future, right? It's not a one and done kind of thing. So John Wesley actually kind of paraphrases this, this uh, concept with the words that we say at the end of worship. That all of us go out into the world with the responsibility of doing the Lord's work by doing all the good that we can do, by all the means that we can do it, in all the ways that we can do the Lord's work in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as we can do it. That's why we say this at the end of worship. is It's our commissioning to go out and do the works that God has get, blessed us with by having the knowledge of salvation. Reflecting Christ means that we actually have to go do the work. On the outside of these walls, on the outside of the walls of our homes, in order for people to believe that there's actually a difference that makes when you have Christ in your life. And it's actually why I'm a Methodist. I think I've shared a part of my call story with you or how I became a Methodist was that you know, I was out of the church for about a decade. And, and when my first wife and I uh, got married and she was a Methodist and we went to the Methodist church in, in Kichai, um, Guy wasn't the pastor there yet, it was Mike Marion, and they started talking about all the things they were going to be doing with building a house in Mexico and and. and doing a youth group trip and I can remember looking at her and saying churches really do this you know it's one thing to know and to hear it and to have the, the capacity in the head for it but to put it into muscle action is a totally different set of skills and I can remember her saying just like she was saying it to me this morning yeah we're Methodist it's what we do So, you know, like I said last week, right, followers of Jesus should all be from Missouri right, to show us, to show that our lives reflect Christ by the topics that we have talked about in this worship series. And if you've missed one, they're, they're out, on, out on YouTube, on the church's YouTube page, and you could watch it. Now, how do we show that we reflect Christ is first by seeking Christ in our lives, by always continually wanting to seek Christ in our lives, by mutual accountability, by being with the least of these in our community, by being vocal advocates for justice, by abundant living, and by loving others, as we talked about last week, loving others as God loves, not loving others as people judge. You know, the avenues with which we deploy these parts of our character is through the tithe. The tithe of our time, the tithe of our talents, and the tithe of our resources that God has blessed us with. The tithe is just not what we collect on Sunday morning, which hopefully you can hear in my prayer, that the other things we do throughout our week are just as important as an offering to God as that. 
And just so you know that Luke is not the only gospel writer that teaches this lesson. He just does it in, in this specific way. But perhaps you've heard about Matthew 25 and the separating out the sheep and the goats. It's the same thing. It's an apocalyptic uh, a, a story about the end of the world. And how does he separate? When you found me hungry, you gave me something to eat. When you found me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When you found me naked, you gave me something to wear. When I was in prison, you visited me. Right? All of those things that Jesus lists out in Matthew 25 are those actions that we know we're supposed to be doing. And Paul provides us with the living example of this. When Paul would go on his missionary journeys, when he would go into a community to plant a church, he didn't build a building first, he didn't build any buildings. No, he sat down in the public square and worked on his tents. He used his craft. Then, and when people came to visit with him about a tent or, 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 or making something for them, he would share the gospel with them. His interactions began with other people by using his time, his talents, and his resources in order to then to bring the gospel to them. And I think one of the most poignant sayings that, that I, I think of in the gospel is Jesus saying, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Anybody ever heard that one? It rains on the just and the unjust alike. And I believe that's important in our discussion this morning about how we use our time and our, our talents and our resources for God because there are craftsmen who don't believe. Right? There are plumbers who don't believe. There are soccer players on that field who don't believe. There are sleepers. <laughs> right, Scott? <laughs> who don't believe. Every skill that, that we can think of, every talent, every resource we can think of, folks who don't believe or folks who aren't associated with a church also have that same skill set. Anyone want to disagree with that? Okay. So the difference then is using the gifts, the, the talents, the time, the resources that we have been blessed with, just like other people have been blessed with, but to use those with the focus on using it as a discipleship tool. And I think, I think that's what verse 48 is really talking about. And it's not necessarily that, that we, we've been given much, but, but the one thing we've been given more than others is not a specific gift or a talent, it's the knowledge of salvation. And that is where our responsibility lies, to use the gifts and graces that we have as a resource, a tool, then to share the good news with others. You know, since Jesus used the slavery uh, imagery in, in the parable, I'm going to take just a moment and do the same as a, as a way of making the point here, what I think Jesus is actually demanding of us. In the plantation system in the American South uh, before the Civil War, it was, it was more common for the master of the plantation to spend his day drinking sweet tea than it was to be out in the fields getting his fingernails dirty by being a part of, of the action. Rather than invest his time, his talents, and his resources into the actual work, he used those to hire the work done through, an, through, through, through a slavery system. So plantation owners had no sweat equity, if you will, in